Hello, and welcome to part 5 of the Unsolved Mystery Mega Iceberg Explained. Frankfurt Jane Doe, 2004 The Frankfurt Jane Doe is a still unknown victim of a serial killer that operated in Frankfurt, Germany. In 2004, her skull was found wrapped in aluminum foil, and no other remains of her have ever been found. The suspect was a man named Manfred Seal. Seal murdered at least five women, possibly up to nine between 1971 and 2004, with this Jane Doe being the next to last victim. Unfortunately, Seal would pass before anyone was aware of his crimes, so he was never charged. He mostly targeted drug-addicted sex workers from the street, as their disappearance is not usually noticed immediately. And although every other victim has been accounted for, this Jane Doe hasn't. Her face was reconstructed with the help of forensics in hopes of someone being able to identify her. It's also never been revealed to how she died, if it's even known. Detectives are also stumped as why the skull was wrapped in aluminum foil. She was thought to be between 40 to 50 years old, but possibly older. She was of Central or Eastern European ancestry. She probably had a neglected appearance, missing a few teeth, possibly a crooked nose, upper lip possibly collapsed, and may have spoken with a lisp. As of today, the woman's identity remains unknown. Jeff in September 1931, the Irvin family, consisting of James, Margaret, and their 13-year-old daughter, Vari, would be subject to a weird mystery at their farmhouse at Cashins Gap, Britain. The family would begin to hear scratching, rustling, and vocal noises from behind the wooden panel at the farmhouse. They at first thought it was a dog, or possibly a ferret. According to the Irvings, a creature would come out and introduce himself as Jeff. He would tell them he was a mongoose born in New Delhi in 1852. According to the 13-year-old daughter, Jeff was the size of a small rat with yellowish fur and a large bushy tail, but not only could Jeff talk, he could also sing. Jeff would continue to tell them things, such as he was an earthbound spirit or a ghost that had possessed a mongoose. According to the Irvins, this mongoose, or spirit, would guard their house and warn them of approaching guests and the like. He was also said to have thrown stones at visitors and was even able to strike a match. He also woke the family up in the morning if they overslept. He had hands about the size of a big doll's hands, with three fingers and a thumb. Supposedly, he lived on biscuits, chocolates, sausages, and bananas that the family left for him on a saucer which they suspended from the ceiling, and Jeff would come take the food when no one was watching. He also followed them to the market, but he would remain hidden from the strangers when doing so, and proving just how boring life was in the 30s. This story actually got a lot of tabloid press. Many journalists flocked to the farm to see the creature. Several local residents, as well as visitors, did claim to hear Jeff's voice, and two people claimed to have seen him. However, no physical evidence was ever found. In 1945, James Irvin would pass, and his widow and daughter would sell the home at a loss due to its reputation of being haunted. In 1946, a man named Leslie Graham would buy the home and tell the press that he shot and killed Jeff. However, upon seeing the body, Vari stated that it was not Jeff. Vari would live until 2005 and would be interviewed before her passing, and she stated the creature did exist and that she did not make anything up. There were a few investigations that looked into this phenomenon, if that's what you want to call it, and a few things were learned. For one, hair from the alleged creature was kept by the family and turned over to a biologist as proof but that was shown to be nothing more than belonging to the family sheepdog. Another thing discovered was speaking into any of the gaps in the panels of the home, which there were many, would carry the voice to other parts of the home. And finally, Nandor Fodor, who was a psychoanalyst, lived in the home for a week without hearing or seeing Jeff, but he did conclude that he did not believe Jeff had been a deliberate deception or hoax. Instead, he believed that Jim Irving was dealing with a split personality and possibly was able to convince the family, or they went along with it voluntarily, that Jeff did exist. However, a reporter that was covering the story would actually catch the daughter of Wari making the noises, and when she realized that she was busted, Jim started trying to convince the man that it came from somewhere else. Most skeptics now believe the hoax was created by Wari and that she may have used ventriloquism, and that her family hyped it up to dupe paranormalist and tabloid reporters. But what do you think? Gustav the Crocodile Gustav is a large Nile crocodile that lives in Burundi. 
He is notorious for being a man-eater, and is rumored to have killed as many as 300 people since the late 80s, and although that number is probably way too high, he has obtained a near-mythical status, and he is feared throughout the region. It is impossible to know his exact measurements, since he has never been captured. But in 2002, an estimate based on witness accounts placed the creature at more than 18 feet and more than 2,000 pounds. If true, that would mean he would have to be over 100 years old, but pictures of the creature have revealed a full set of teeth, which would not be possible if he was 100, so it's more than likely he was around 60. Pictures also revealed three bullet scars, one on his right shoulder, which was deeply wounded. Scientists believe that his uncommon size and weight make him too slow to hunt fish, antelope, and zebra, forcing him to attack hippos, large buffaloes, and yes, even humans. In 2004, a scientist Patrice Fay tried to capture Gustav. The documentary would be aired on PBS and was called Capturing the Killer Croc. After setting a trap cage 30 feet in length, the crew would use several baits, yet nothing attracted the beast. On the last attempt, they would use a live goat in an attempt to lure him in. But stormy weather hit that night, and when the crew awoke the next morning, they found the cage partially submerged and the goat had disappeared. Even crazier, the camera had failed during the storm, so no one is sure what happened. It's hard to say for sure what is and what isn't real with Gustav, just because he has become something of a legend. The 300 number, as previously mentioned, is no doubt wrong. An estimate of 60 was brought up in other accounts, which is probably more accurate and still a huge count. There's also another legend about the creature that states he killed for fun, saying that he would kill humans and then swim off. If that is true, scientists say it's because he abandoned the kill after realizing humans weren't his typical meal. Other explanations for his attacking the humans is directly tied to the violence in the area. Burundi was going through a civil war between 93 and 2005, and Dara claims a genocide, and it's thought the perpetrators threw the victims in the water, knowing that people would blame the crocodiles, but it's also been speculated that Gustav may have developed a taste for humans when he started scavenging victims that were dumped in the water. Lastly, another theory is that it was just several different crocodiles being misidentified as one. The last alleged sighting of the monster was in 2015. He was supposedly finally killed in 2019. However, no proof has ever been provided. If he is still alive, he would be around 81 years old. And since Nile crocs tend to live 50 to 60 years, it's probably safe to assume he is dead. Hair Bundles of Santa Barbara Mesa This is a little mystery from Santa Barbara Mesa in California. Apparently, mysterious bundles of hair started popping up around town in 2019, mainly around areas called Carrillo Hill, Miggs Road, and Cliff Drive. From what I could find, the hair is dark in color and braided up or bundled up for some reason. Some witnesses have seen someone throwing the bundles from the car, but no one else could corroborate that. As I mentioned, this mystery hardly has any info and very little theories. Although most lean that it was probably some kind of prank or possibly some kind of superstition to ward off evil. Hall Mills Murders On a brisk Saturday morning around 10 a.m. on September 16, 1922, a couple on a walk through the countryside of New Brunswick, New Jersey would come across two bodies. Authorities would be called and they would arrive shortly later to discover a horrifying scene. Both bodies lay on their backs, and both had been shot with a 32 caliber pistol. The man was shot once, and the lady three times. All headshots. The woman's throat had also been slit. Investigators deduced that the murders had been committed at least a full day before. They also discovered that the bodies had been moved after the murders, to lay side by side of each other. The suspect, or suspects, had also laid their feet pointing towards a crab apple tree. The man had his right arm positioned to touch the woman's neck while the woman's left hand was positioned on the man's right thigh. Her tongue had also been cut out. The man, meanwhile, had his hat removed and placed over his face, covering the gunshot wound. And in between the two bodies, lie torn up love letters the two had written to each other, while the man's calling card also lay at his feet. The investigation was complicated from the start because of the location of the murders, which lie on the border of Somerset County and Middlesex County, causing a jurisdictional issue New Brunswick Police of Middlesex County actually arrived on the scene first, but Franklin Township Police of Somerset County arrived shortly after, and the authorities would have to step to the side 
to figure out exactly who should be working the scene. While that was going on, curious townsfolk would come in and trample the scene. People came in and took souvenirs and passed the man's calling card around. The physical evidence was totally compromised. Shortly after, the two would be identified as Edward Willer Hall, an Episcopal priest from New Brunswick, and a woman named Eleanor Reinhardt Mills. The investigation would move along, and detectives discovered a lurid tale. It appeared that the married reverend was having an affair with the also married Eleanor, who also sung in the church choir. With everything found at the scene and the torn up love letters, it was pretty easy to narrow down who the suspects were. Detectives and the prosecutor built a case that revolved around the theory that the angry wife, Frances, had orchestrated the whole thing. She had convinced her two brothers and one cousin to carry out the murders. Her brother Henry would be the one accused of firing the shots, while brother William owned a 32 like the one used in the murder, and his fingerprint was found on the Reverend's calling card at the scene. Cousin Henry Carpenter, who was also an original suspect, was never brought to trial. The key witness was a woman named Jane Gibson, also known as the Pig Woman because she ran a pig farm. She told investigators the night of the murder her dog was barking loudly around 9 p.m. She went outside and saw a man standing in the cornfield. When she got closer, she saw four people standing at a crab apple tree. She then heard gunshots and one of the people fell to the ground. She then turned around and hurried back to her home when she heard more gunshots. She turned around to see a second person fall. The trial would start four years later and lasted about a month. The case came down to the key witness Jane Gibson. The defense would betray her as uneducated and crazy, trying to ruin her credibility, which was easy to do given her erratic actions. And Gibson damaged her own credibility by telling different stories to each, the police, the newspapers, and at the trial. Jurors would hear 157 witnesses and then deliberate for five hours. And in spite of a clear motive and the means, all three were acquitted. You'll notice one underreported part of this whole thing. That is... What about Eleanor's husband, James Mills? Was he never considered? Apparently, he was never seriously investigated for the murders because he was not around town as a pushover or a wimp. The case remains unsolved a hundred years later. Hidden Character Stone In June 2002, the Duyin International Photography Exposition recommended an area in Jongbu to shoot some photos. After the exposition, the cleanup process would begin. It was during this cleanup a curious stone was discovered. This stone, which sat in an area that had been untouched by humans for centuries, had several characters written on it. The person who discovered it would report it, and a team of Chinese scientists would go to investigate the stone. Each character on the stone measured about one square foot each, and the characters are both in traditional and simplified Chinese. One interpretation could be translated to say, Communist Party of China, which is generally accepted. But the other version is interpreted to say, Communist Party of China perish. Unsurprisingly, this is not an accepted interpretation in China. The origins of the characters remain unknown, but skeptics believe that the village created the fraud to bring tourism to the area. Highway of Tears You have no doubt heard of this one. Highway of Tears is a 450 mile stretch of Highway 16 between Prince George and Prince Rupert in British Columbia, Canada which has been the site of many disappearances and murders that started in 1970. The victims seem to have a disproportionately high number of indigenous women. Accounts vary on the exact number of victims, but the RCMP project EPANA, which was started to see if there was a serial killer responsible for a number of the victims, would initially work on trying to link up to 18 of them, while aboriginal organizations estimate the number of missing and murdered over 40, while other estimates put the count well over 80. The first time the RCMP tried to actually link all the cases, though, came in December of 98. Since that time, a number of people have been arrested and convicted for the murders. Three of those were serial killers. Of the remaining cases, which there are many, law enforcement have several persons of interest, but not enough evidence to arrest. The biggest issue leading to all these disappearances is the rural area is plagued with poverty and no public transportation. This leaves the indigenous peoples with no option but to hitchhike, which of course attracts some of the worst people to drive around these areas looking for victims. Not helping is the stretches of area with no cell phone coverage, along with various logging roads off the side of the highway that a potential predator could use. Lots of propositions have been made to address these issues. 
such as bringing in public transit, like a shuttle bus that runs along Highway 16. I hesitate to call this one a mystery, because most of the cases are isolated ones. Each one is a mystery on its own, and it's not necessarily connected to any of the other ones, and it's because the area is ripe for some evil people to just patrol the areas looking for victims. How To Basic How To Basic is an Australian YouTube comedy channel with over 17 million subscribers. It is the fifth biggest channel in Australia. The premise of the channel is to create intentional clickbait titles to mislead first-time viewers to check out the videos. He does this by using specific video titles, thumbnails, descriptions, as well as his channel description, which claims to be a tutorial channel for many subjects, especially cooking. Once a video is clicked, you see a video from the YouTuber's point of view, with food and objects, etc. And he pretends to be really showing you how to do the task at hand, before he suddenly starts throwing, destroying, and creating a large mess with whatever object he is using. I think the mystery here is, just who is this guy that's running How To Basic, as he has never showed his face. Even though he had a video teasing the face reveal, he never actually done it. Human Bone and Primark Socks Primark is a leading international clothing retailer that operates in 14 different countries. And in December of 2019, their Colchester store in Essex, England, would come across a very peculiar mystery, as a pair of socks purchased at the store would end up having a human bone found in it. A bone believed to have been a finger. Police would be called and they came out to investigate, but they could not link it to any crime. They would state, quote, At this time, it is not linked to a criminal act. It is a possibility it was placed in the sock in its country of origin, but this cannot be confirmed. It did not appear to be the result of recent trauma and had no skin or other particles surrounding it, end quote. And Primark would say, quote, It is highly probable that the object was placed in the socks by an individual for unknown reasons. Primark has been the subject of isolated incidents in the past, which have subsequently been found to have been hoaxes. Following our own and the police investigation, we consider the matter closed, end quote. This mystery alone could probably be written off as a hoax, but the Primark chain has had a couple instances like this before that has led to allegations of its connections to working with sweatshops. A customer in Northern Ireland claimed to have found a note in the pocket of a pair of pants she bought in 2014 that said in Chinese, quote, SOS, we work 15 hours every day and eat food that wouldn't even be fed to pigs and dogs. We're forced to work like oxen, end quote. However, this claim is dubious considering the person that bought the pants waited four years to bring the news to light. There was another incident, though, where a customer displayed a label inside her shirt that said, quote, degrading sweatshop, end quote, while another said, quote, forced to work exhausting hours, end quote. So was this just a hoax? Or was it an attempt by someone to draw attention to horrible work conditions? You decide. Injured Code in November 1966, a man named Woodrow Derenberger was returning from a business trip in Marietta, Ohio. Woodrow was a sewing machine salesman and was making the trip back to his home in Mineral Wells, West Virginia, when he had a very strange experience. Derenberger would report that a car would pass him, overtaking him from behind, and following closely behind that car was an unidentified flying object. As soon as the car passed him, so would the UFO, and swerve in front of his truck turning crosswise, not so close that he had to stop abruptly. It gave him plenty time to stop. But he said the lights on the aircraft looked like a, quote, kerosene lamp chimney, end quote. A man would step out of this vehicle, or whatever this thing was, and approach Derenberger's truck. Derenberger would say, quote, he looked perfectly natural and normal as any human being. His face looked like he had a good tan, a deep sun tan. He was not too dark, but it was just like he had been out in the sun a lot and had a good tan. His hair was combed straight back, and it was dark brown, and he seemed to have a good thick head of hair. His features were very normal. I don't believe that he looked any different from any other man that you would meet on the street." End quote. And although Woodrow's description of the man sounds fairly normal, what he went on to say wasn't. The man apparently had a large grin and kept his arms folded with his hands up and under his armpits and then spoke to Derenberger, yet his lips never moved. 
It was then that he realized this man was speaking to him telepathically. Quote, He asked me to roll down the window on my right-hand side of my truck, and I done what he asked. And this man stood there, and he first asked me what I was called, and I know he meant my name, and I told him my name, and he asked me, he said, Why are you frightened? He said, Don't be frightened. We wish you no harm. We mean you no harm. We wish you only happiness. And I told him my name, and when I told him my name, he said he was called Code. End quote. The man would go on to state his full name was Injured Code. The man would then have a small talk with Derenberger, asking him where he was headed and what town was next. Code would then return to his vehicle and fly away. Derenberger would actually go and report his encounter to the Parkersburg police, and the next day the story took off. As Derenberger would do an interview with television station WTAP, the police, along with representatives from Wood County Airport, would interview him as well. But maybe the strangest part was a representative from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base was sent out to see him. And in case you wasn't aware, tons of conspiracies surround Wright-Patterson, as it is much like Area 51. And at first, most would write this off as an attention seeker, or maybe a tired driver having a hallucination. But others would come forward, claiming to have had similar experiences. A man would report he saw someone match an injured code's description trying to flag him down, but he drove on by because the whole event scared him. A few others seen the lights and, quote, fluttering vehicles, end quote, on the same road Derenberger was on. But maybe the most crucial testimony, several witnesses reported to have seen Derenberger stopped on the side of the road talking to this strange individual known as Injured Code. This was a hot topic on the local news for a few weeks before it finally died down. Unfortunately for Derenberger, it did not die down, as the strange grinning man would start to visit him over the next month. Derenberger would spend the rest of his life mocked and ridiculed for this story, and went through bouts of depression because of it. He would pass away in 1990, at the age of 74, never knowing exactly who he encountered that night. So what exactly was this thing that Derenberger seen? Was it an alien like many think? A ghost or spirit? Or did Derenberger get pranked? It could have easily been a hoax to play off the fear of Mothman, which had been first sighted around the same time. Others think it could have just been a mentally ill man. J.R. Rattray Dipping back into one of the more obscure mysteries, we come across a really sad one here. On July 2nd, 1935, in Hastings, New Zealand, six-year-old Joan Rose Rattray was walking home on her way from school around 4 p.m., her mother Hazel was waiting on her, along with her two brothers. But at 4 p.m., her two brothers would arrive without Joan. Hazel would ask the boys where Joan was, and they replied that she never met up with them after school. Joan's mother would alert authorities immediately, and a large contingent of police responded quickly. Detectives would go speak to Joan's teacher, Isabel Palmer, who reported that there was nothing unusual about Joan that day. No bruises on her body, and she didn't say or do anything out of the ordinary. Miss Palmer would state that she heard Joan's brother David tell her at 2.30 to come home straight after school. Yet Miss Palmer never actually did see her leave the school. Yet detectives were able to establish that Joan did in fact leave the school on her own. A full day later, around 3.30 p.m. on July 3rd, the coroner would be called out to Rua Hapia Road. He would be shown the body of a girl on the bank of Karamu Creek. An investigation of the scene would get underway, and they discovered a beret and underwear about 10 feet away. They also found a shoe impression in the mud of a size 7 man's shoe or boot. Inspection of the body revealed that she had an injury on her left eye, but her cause of death was suffocation due to her face being held down in the mud. It is important to note, however, that she was not assaulted or violated in any other way. Understandably, the community was shocked and very outraged. This prompted a huge investigation, but in spite of the response, investigators could find no leads. They found no motive or meaning to the crime. No bitter ex, no custody battles, or anything like that. They determined that most likely he was just passing through. There would never be a suspect found. Jameson Family This one is a highly publicized mystery that you have most likely heard of so I'll spare you a lot of the details. 
But on October 8th, 2009, the Jamison family, Bobby, his wife Sherry Lynn, and his daughter Madison, all mysteriously disappeared. The family's pickup truck was found abandoned in Latimer County, Oklahoma, a few days after they disappeared. But the family was nowhere to be seen, yet their dog was still in the truck, and he was still alive, just a little malnourished. Investigation of the truck revealed the family's ID cards, wallets, mobile phones, a GPS, and about $32,000 in cash, which was definitely odd. Detectives would go back and search the family home, and they found their surveillance cameras. They would go back over the previous footage to find the moment when they left their home. It showed what can only be described as bizarre, as the family was shown making several silent trips between their vehicle and home as they packed to leave. The couple's movements were described as trance-like. The video also showed Sherry Lynn place a brown briefcase in the vehicle. That briefcase, along with Sherry Lynn's handgun, were never recovered. Neighbors would also report days leading up to the disappearance. Bobby and Sherry Lynn had both been acting strangely and looked gaunt and emaciated, like they could have been using drugs heavily. The couple had driven to Latimer County to look at a 40-acre plot of land on Panola Mountain and had specifically requested to view it without a real estate agent. Four years later in November 2013, in a remote spot of Latimer County, hunters would find the skeletal remains of two adults and a child. He was later revealed to be that of the Jamison family. Their bodies were discovered less than three miles away from where their truck had been abandoned. Because of the state of the bodies, there was no way to determine the cause of death. As far as theories go, there were numerous. One early theory was that Bobby's father could have been involved. As the two of them were involved in a bitter lawsuit at the time, Bobby stated at one point that his father was involved in meth and criminal activity. He also accused him of having connections to the Mexican cartel. Detectives, for their part, have ruled out Bobby's father, mainly because he had an ironclad alibi, as he was in the hospital at the time. The other popular theory was the Jamison themselves were drug dealers. This could explain why the couple had $32,000 cash on them, and it could also explain their strange behavior. They were heavily rumored to be meth users, and to add another weird wrinkle, the couple's pastor, Gary Brandon, said that Bobby had confided in him that they kept seeing spirits in the family home. Could this have been drug-induced hallucinations? If so, it is weird that detectives could not find any drugs in the home or in the vehicle. Other theories propose a murder-suicide scenario, as detectives found a suspicious letter in the truck, one that was 11 pages long, and it was a very angry, hateful letter from Sherry Lynn to Bobby. Could she have killed him? If she did, what did she do with the gun? Or did the family just go out to look at a plot of land, and somehow got lost in the thick forest, and died from the elements? Jennifer Fairgate On June 3, 1995, a woman would check into the Oslo Plaza Hotel under the name Jennifer Fairgate, although this would later be proven to have been a false identity. And the woman must have not been very familiar with the name, since she misspelled it twice on her hotel paperwork. She would check into room 2805, and by some accounts, she was traveling with a man named Lois Farragate. She would provide a fake home address to a small village in Belgium. Three days later, after not seeing the woman for two days, security was sent to check on her. As soon as the security guard knocked on the door, a gunshot went off. The guard would quickly go down to the bottom floor to call authorities. When they arrived, her death was ruled a suicide, as she was found holding a brown and 9mm. Yet strangely enough, there was no gunshot residue on her hand, as well as no blood. The recoil also should have knocked the gun out of her hand, but it didn't. And finally, her fingerprints wouldn't even own the gun. The evidence leaned more heavily towards murder, rather than suicide. But perhaps the strangest part was she was last seen the previous night when she ordered food at 8.06 p.m. Room service would deliver the food, and the woman would tip the staff. That undigested food would be found in the autopsy, suggesting that she died shortly after eating, which means she either ate the night before and was murdered then, or she put the food in the fridge to eat the next day. But assuming that she had ate the night before, it meant that the killer was still in the room and fired the shot that scared off the security guard, allowing him time to escape. Another odd fact was that the woman had not paid for anything the whole stay. 
and then the front desk had sent a message to her through her TV that notified her to get in touch with them immediately. Someone pushed a button on the remote, acknowledging the message. If she had died the night before, who confirmed the message? Hotel staff would also note, there was an acrid smell in her room. Could this have been from the gunfire, or was it from the body decomposition? No identification could be found in the hotel room, and the pistol serial number was scratched off. Another odd thing in this case was the woman had left the hotel only once during her stay, and she was gone for over 20 hours. The maid would claim that she went into the room to clean, and it was completely empty, and it looked like it had not even been touched. They believed her to be around 24 to 30 years old, in spite of the fact that she had filled out that she was 21 on her paperwork. She stood 5 foot 3 and weighed 147 pounds, and had blue eyes with short black hair. She had extensive dental work done in gold and porcelain, indicating that she was wealthy. All her clothes were expensive, but the brand tags had been removed from all but one. The main theory in this case has always been that this unknown woman was a spy, as removing tags from clothing, removing serial numbers from weapons, and a false identity are all common practices of spies. As far as the man goes, it's unclear of his involvement, identity, or even where he was at at the time of her death. Detectives aren't even sure he was ever in the room. The woman's body was exhumed in late 2016, and DNA was successfully taken in 2017. However, Norway does not allow DNA from a deceased person to be used to try and find a genetic match. But two mysteries remain. Who was this woman, and what exactly happened to her? Was she just a depressed woman that really committed suicide, and maybe went to great lengths to hide her identity? Was she a spy that was hunted down by another spy? Jerome of Sandy Cove On September 8, 1863, eight-year-old George Albright was playing on a beach at Sandy Cove, Nova Scotia, when he discovered an odd sight. In the sand lie a swarthy young man with both legs amputated just above the knees. George would go to get help, and two farmers would come back to help take the castaway back to town. Residents would begin to question the man, but he didn't reply. So they speculated that he did not speak English. They would eventually ask him his name, and he would mumble something that resembled Jerome, and that is what he would come to be known as. After looking Jerome over more, they realized that his amputations had been done by a skilled surgeon. Even more bizarre was they were only partially healed, as they were found to still be bandaged. He also suffered from hypothermia, from being left out on the beach overnight. People from all over the area would travel to see him in his sickbed. Different languages were tried in efforts to communicate with the man as well. French, Latin, Italian, and Spanish. Yet he did not understand, or he just refused to communicate. Although sometimes he would growl like a dog at unwanted guests. He was described as being Mediterranean in appearance, while his hands were noted as being too soft for manual labor. George's parents did not have the money to support another person in their home. So Jerome would bounce from house to house for a while, until this Baptist community somehow came up with the thought that Jerome must have come from a Catholic background. It's because of this, they would send him to the neighboring French community of Medigan. It was at this point, the Nova Scotia government would provide a $2 a week stipend to support Jerome. The community would eventually send Jerome to stay with a man named Jean Nicolas, who spoke several languages. He would keep Jerome in his home for the next seven years, and Jerome spoke very little, although he was able to speak a few fragmented sentences. He revealed that he'd come over on a vessel named the Colombo. He would next move in with Dadier and Zabeth Camo in St. Alphonse de Clare, near Midigan. It was here that the Camos took advantage of his fame, charging admission fees to see the mystery man. A couple of theories about who this man was and how he ended up on a beach with recent amputations have been proposed. One suggestion was that he was in line for a big inheritance, and someone did away with him so they could be the one to inherit instead. Yet it doesn't make sense as to why they wouldn't just kill him. Some thought he could have been a wounded officer from a European war, or perhaps even the Civil War in the United States. One of the bigger questions is why Jerome was unable to talk, and it's thought he suffered a stroke from hypothermia, damaging a part of his brain. Finally, a theory in 2008 stated that on the other side of the Bay of Fundy, in Chipman, New Brunswick, in the year 1859, 
just four years before Jerome was discovered on the beach. A man fell through river ice. He developed gangrene on both of his legs due to the accident and had to have them amputated. Upon waking, the man kept saying Gambi, which he was probably trying to say Gamba, which means leg in Italian. Here he became known as Gambi. It's thought that Gambi became too much of a burden for the people of Chipman, and it was rumored that someone in the town paid a passing ship to transport him away. The captain could have possibly just sailed to the opposite side of the bay, to Nova Scotia, and dropped him off on Sandy Cove. In fact, several witnesses have stated that it was the same person. However, to this day, no one is for sure. John Doe number 24 In the early morning hours of October 11, 1945, two police officers would find a black teenager wandering around the streets of Jacksonville, Illinois. They quickly determined him to be deaf and unable to communicate. Upon asking why he was out wandering the street, he could only write Lewis, which is said to have been his name. Authorities would search around for quite a bit, trying to find his relatives, but they were unable to. They also tried to find out more about the teen himself, but failed there as well. After not being able to find his family, a judge would place him in an Illinois mental health facility. It's here that he would be given the name John Doe No. 24. The state facilities in those times were known to be particularly cruel and abusive. However, John Doe No. 24 was always happy and upbeat during his time there. But it is here that he would live the remainder of his life. He would pass away on November 28, 1993, at the age of 64. In all of those years, no one ever reported him missing. Nothing is known about his past or where he came from, although it's most likely the family could no longer care for him and they let him out in a safe area to be found by the police. Sadly, this case will probably never be resolved. Johnny Joe Shields On December 15, 1988, Johnny Joe Shields, who lived with his mother in Carter Lake, Iowa, would leave her residence at 2 a.m. in the morning. Later the next day, Johnny still had not returned, and his mother grew concerned and would call the police to report him missing. The 32-year-old had left all of his belongings, as well as his truck behind. Furthermore, his bank account has never been touched since he disappeared. Police have classified his disappearance as involuntary, stating that he was taken somewhere against his will. Sadly though, this is all that's publicly available about this case. Juvenile Hobby Armana and Cyprian Interi Amara. Please forgive me if I botched those names. At 8.20 p.m. of April 6, 1994, Rwandan President Juvenile Habi Armana and Burundian President Cyprian Interi Amara were on a presidential jet and were about ready to land at Kigali International Airport in Rwanda. A weekly flight by a Belgian airplane carrying United Nations peacekeepers was actually waved off to let the presidential jet land first. As the jet made its descent, a surface-to-air missile struck one of the wings, followed by a missile to the aircraft's tail. The plane erupted into flames in mid-air before crashing into the garden of the palace, exploding on impact. Not only would the crash kill both presidents, it also killed seven members of their staffs as well as the three-man French flight crew. The attack was seen by several people, and the United Nations soldiers stationed there would obviously bunker down and start organizing their defense just in case. On the ground, everything turned chaotic. The Rwandan army was dispatched, and at first, there were reports that the president was not dead. And by 9.30, a full hour and a half later, there was still much confusion about what was going on. Now, I'm not even going to pretend to understand or know anything about African geopolitics, especially from the 90s, me attempting to do so would just do disrespect to all those involved. However, the key points you should know are these. It's believed the Rwandan president, Juvenal Javier Amana, is the one that was targeted. Everyone else on board was just collateral damage. Secondly, and most importantly, this act is what led directly to the Rwandan genocide, which we discussed earlier when talking about Gustav the Crocodile. The Rwandan genocide is one of the bloodiest events in the late 20th century with an estimated 500 to 600,000 Tutsi deaths. Finally, the most important part is the mystery, just who was responsible. It's been nearly 30 years, and opinions are varied. Most seem to agree that the Rwandan Patriot Front, acting on the orders of the now Rwandan President Paul Kagame, which makes sense, considering he led the same group in the 1990 Rwandan Civil War, yet others dispute this. A declassified U.S. Department of State intelligence report stated that an unidentified source told the U.S. Ambassador in Rwanda that rogue Hutu elements in the military, perhaps part of the Presidential Guard, were responsible for shooting down the plane. To this day, 
the assassination of two presidents aboard one flight is still technically unsolved. Karen Silkwood Karen Silkwood was an American chemical technician and labor union activist who is best known for raising concerns related to health and safety working in a nuclear facility. She worked at Karen McGee Cimarron Fuel Fabrication Site in Oklahoma, where she made plutonium pellets. She would go on to testify to the Atomic Energy Commission about her concerns. After testifying, she would be found to be contaminated by plutonium, as well as it was found throughout her home. Questions over this would arise, as Karen thought she got contaminated at the plant, while the plant's management accused Karen of contaminating herself in order to make the company look bad. And this is where the mystery comes in. As Karen would die in a mysterious car crash shortly after this, she had made plans to meet New York Times journalist David Burnham, whom she was going to take this story public with. She had just finished assembling documentation for her claims, and on November 13th, 1974, Karen would leave a union meeting with a binder and a packet of documents. She planned to make the 30-mile drive to Oklahoma City to meet up with Burnham, but later that evening, her body would be found in her car, which had run off the road and into a culvert. Karen was pronounced dead at the scene, and her death was ruled an accident. The police report stated that she fell asleep at the wheel and that she had almost twice the amount of recommended dosage for a sedative that she had been taking. Speculation began almost immediately, as several journalists theorized that Karen's car was rammed from behind by another vehicle, causing her to crash, and there was some proof for this too, as there were skid marks from her car on the road that suggested that she tried to get the car back up onto the road after being pushed from behind. Detectives would also note the damage to the rear of her car which shouldn't have happened since the crash was a front-end collision. A microscopic examination was done that revealed paint chips that could have only came from a rear impact from another vehicle. And considering the car was new, with no insurance claims, it's unlikely that the damage was there before. Furthermore, the documents her family and friends said she was carrying were missing. Although the state trooper that was first to the scene said, he seen several documents scattered in the mud and tossed them into the back of her wrecked car. Also was the fact that weeks leading up to the crash, Karen had received several threatening phone calls, but with all that stated, none of the foul play accusations have ever been substantiated. However, several theories have been proposed in relation to her death. One is the obvious, that Karen McGee had killed her to silence her before going public with all the evidence that she had gathered that supported her claims about an unsafe work environment. But there are some other crazier theories out there. Her own real estate attorney wrote a book about it. Daniel Sheehan in his book The People's Advocate claimed that Silkwood had unwittingly uncovered a plot to smuggle plutonium to foreign countries such as Israel, Brazil, Iran, and South Africa. And finally, some people think Karen may have committed suicide, as she had attempted to at least once before the year prior. Kaspar Hausa On May 26, 1828, a teenage boy would appear in the streets of Nuremberg, Germany, carrying a letter with him that was addressed to the captain of the 4th Squadron of the 6th Cavalry Regiment, Captain von Wessenig. The letter read, quote, From the Bavarian border, the place is unnamed, 1828, end quote. The unknown author would then go on to say that the boy was given into his custody on October 7th, 1812, and he taught him to read and write, as well as Christianity, but he never let him, quote, take a single step out of my house, end quote. The letter would then say the boy would like to be a cavalryman, like his father was, and ask the captain to take him in or to hang him. Another letter that was attached was supposedly from his mother, which said his name was Kaspar, and he was born on April 30th, 1812, and that his father was also a cavalryman of the 6th Regiment, but he was now deceased. Suspiciously, both handwritings looked to be the same. A shoemaker would take the boy to the house of Captain von Wessening, but Kaspar would only repeat the words, quote, I want to be a cavalryman, as my father was, end quote. If questioned about anything else, the boy would cry or say don't know. He seemed to have a very small vocabulary, he wouldn't end up being taken to a police station, where he was able to show he was familiar with money, as well as writing his name. He could also read a little, and say some prayers. He would end up being in prison for being a vagrant, and sent to Luggins on Tower, in the care of a jailer named Andreas Hilltail, where he would spend the next two months. He was said to be in good physical condition, and he was thought to be around 16 years old. He did appear intellectually impaired, though. However, the boy was said to have an excellent memory, and he learned quickly. He was also noted... He refused all food except bread and water. At first, people believed he may have been a wild child that grew up in the forest, but Hauser would later reveal that he grew up in solitary confinement in a darkened cell with only a straw bed to sleep on and a couple toys carved out of wood. He claimed to wake every morning, finding rye bread and water next to his bed, and sometimes that water would taste bitter and it caused him to sleep more deeply. 
and when he would awaken from these deep sleeps, he would see that someone had came in, changed his straw, and cut his hair and nails. He would also claim shortly before he was released, a stranger would visit him and taught him how to read and write, all while keeping his face concealed. There would be a couple incidents in the following years involving Kaspar that were a little suspicious. One was the claim that he had been attacked in his cell by some hooded man and that he threatened to kill him if he didn't leave Nuremberg. Yet, the boy had taken a razor back to his room prior and it's believed he may have bladed himself and made the entire story up. Then there was the story of a gun accident that the boy claimed he had suffered, yet the wound was superficial, meaning that the boy was very lucky that the bullet just grazed him or that he injured himself on purpose and then shot the gun, meaning again, he was lying. These two events destroyed Kaspar's credibility. But December of 1833, Hauser would come home with a deep wound in his left breast. He claimed someone had stabbed him in the court garden. He would die three days later. Detectives would comb the scene and found a small purse with a letter that basically claimed to have killed Hauser. And the mystery today is, was Kaspar's origin, as well as his death, fact or fiction? There have been a couple psychological studies done on this case. Most have found that he was nothing more than a pathological liar, and his story is too full of absurdities to be real. Yet others still claim that he was kin to a powerful royal family, and like most cases, he was hidden and then sent away for one reason or another. Kathy Page In the early morning hours of May 14, 1991, a car would be found in a ditch in Vador, Texas. It had apparently crashed at some point during the night. Once police arrived, they quickly identified the woman as 34-year-old Kathy Page. But upon investigation, detectives would notice odd things about the accident. For one, there were no obvious wounds or injuries on her body, in spite of the fact that she had just died in an automobile accident. And speaking of that accident, it barely even damaged the car. It was also very weird how the soft drinks in the front seat had not even spilled. But maybe the two most damning clues her legs weren't even stretched out towards the pedals. Instead, they were back against the seat. And finally, even though she wasn't wearing a seatbelt, she remained perfectly seated in her reclined position. Investigators would note that the crash scene happened only 100 yards away from Kathy's home. When they went there, her husband Steve answered the door. When they told him that she had died, he was apparently upset. He would even cry. But this quickly stopped, and then he started acting like nothing was wrong. Detectives would walk out of the home thinking Steve was their man, but they had to build a case first. The autopsy revealed that she died by strangulation and had a broken nose and black eye, as well as bloodstains on her underwear and skin. Detectives believe that she was killed in another location, was cleaned up and dressed and then placed in the car. Stephen and Kathy had been married for 13 years, but according to Kathy's sister Sherry, the two were headed for divorce and Kathy was moving on with her life. Steve, on the other hand, had claimed the two had separated and talked about a divorce before deciding to get back together and work it out. The night before the accident, Kathy had asked Stephen to babysit the kids while she went out with a girlfriend named Charlotte, but she didn't go see a girlfriend. She went to see her new boyfriend instead. The autopsy would confirm that she had intercourse that night too, which her boyfriend confirmed. However, the autopsy revealed that whoever she had intercourse with had a visectomy. Her new boyfriend didn't, but Stephen did. When questioned about this, Steve admitted they had sex that night, but it happened before she went out. But Kathy's family does not believe this for obvious reasons. Making things worse for Steve is, his sister-in-law would state that on the night of the murder, he would call two different numbers. He called Charlotte first, the friend that Kathy was supposed to be with, and after that, he called a local hotel. Things were starting to add up. Kathy's family believes that when she got back from meeting with her boyfriend, Steve sexually assaulted her, and then killed her, and placed her body in the car, and rolled it into a ditch. But Steve's defense gets goofy, as he blames the murder on some Italian family, called the Beaumont Mafia and that police are framing him. Whereas Kathy's family claims, Steve's parents are close to the police chief, who have refused to go after Steve. In their defense, it did take the district attorney three years to even issue a warrant to search Steve's home, so there might be something to it. But law enforcement have always claimed that this is not the case, and that they simply do not have the smoking gun to arrest Steve. The case is still unsolved, but I mean, come on. Kanika Jenkins, on September 8th, 2017, Kanika Jenkins would go tell her mother, Teresa, that she was going to go out with some friends. They had planned to go bowling and then go to a movie to celebrate her getting a job at a nursing home. Her mom allowed her to borrow the car and she would leave about 11 p.m. that night. Kanika and her friends did not end up going bowling though or to a movie either. Instead, they end up going to a party on the ninth floor of the Crown Plaza Chicago O'Hare Hotel in Rosemont, Illinois. Her and her friends would share live videos on Snapchat and Facebook during the party. And at times, it seemed like the girls were upset at some of the males at the party 
who were aggressively flirting with them. Even after they made it known to the guys that they weren't interested, they persisted anyways. It was after this around 1.30 a.m. that Kanika would text her sister. That would be the last text her family ever got from her. At around 3 a.m., the girls would decide to leave the party, and once they reached the hotel lobby, Kanika would realize she had forgotten her keys, cell phone, and her other belongings back in the room. One story is the girls went back to get Kanika's stuff for her and left her in the hotel lobby, while another story says they went to get her stuff and left her on the ninth floor next to the elevator. Whatever the case, they did leave Kanika alone. They would return within 10 to 20 minutes and find that Kanika was no longer there. After they searched the hotel, they would end up calling her mom to see if she had gotten a ride home, but her mom said she had not talked to her. The girls would then go pick her up and bring her back to help search for Kanika. The hotel was pretty much useless in helping. They actually refused, and the hotel staff said that only police could look at the security footage, so Teresa called 911 at 7.15 a.m., but the dispatcher told Teresa that the girls were probably lying and Kanika had passed out in a random hotel room. But when she didn't return home the next day, she would report her missing again. Police would launch an investigation at 1.15 p.m. on September 9th. They would go to the hotel, and the staff said they had looked over the footage and didn't see anything. Police would search around the hotel and found nothing either. Police would look over the footage one more time to see if they had missed anything. It's here that they would find the footage of an extremely intoxicated Kanika, confused and stumbling into walls. She was so drunk that at one point, she walked into the men's restroom. She eventually made it to a kitchen, which was under renovation. The last footage shows her walking towards the freezer. Kanika's family's worst fears would be realized when they found her in the freezer the following morning. Detectives stated there was no foul play and theorized that she walked into the freezer and was too drunk to get back out. But Kanika's family contend that her friend's stories are suspicious as their stories have been inconsistent. They also suspect the hotel of a cover-up. Kirsty Bentley, on New Year's Eve, 1998, at around 10.30 a.m., 15-year-old Kirsty Bentley would go to meet a friend at the Ashburton Library. They would then go do some shopping and head to McDonald's around noon. Bentley would be dropped off at her home by her friend's sister at around 2.30 p.m. When she walked into her home, her brother would tell her that her boyfriend had called and left a message asking her to call him back. She would call him back at 2.38 p.m., but he wasn't there, so she left a message asking him to call her back. So Kirsty would decide to take her black Labrador Abby for a walk. She did this often, as a way to pass the time. Her brother John did not hear her leave the house, but a neighbor did see her walking the dog at 3.05 p.m. Kirsty's boyfriend would call back at 4.30, and it was this phone call that John first noticed that his sister was still absent. His mom Jill would come in from work around 5.15 p.m., and he immediately told her that Kirsty still had not come home. Her mom would call Kirsty's boyfriend to make sure he did not know where she was. Jill would then go search for Kirsty on foot. After no sign of her though, Jill would become increasingly nervous. She would go back home and her and John, Kirsty's brother, agreed to wait until 6, and if she didn't show, they would do another search. Again, Kirsty did not show, so John would go search the dog walking route, and shortly after, Kirsty's father Sid arrived home, and he would call the police. Authorities responded quickly, and the search was intense throughout the evening, which was helped by her family and friends. They would search the entire night and didn't find one clue. Law enforcement would start what they called their official search and rescue the next morning at 8 a.m. By 10 a.m., the dog Abby had been found tied to a tree in a patch of dense foliage beside the Ashburton River, which was strange because they had searched that area the night before and the dog wasn't there, but detectives conceded that with the dense foliage and fog, it was possible they just missed it. Nearby, they would find underwear and boxer shorts, which both belonged to Kirsty. After this, the search would expand out. New Zealand's army would even send troops in from a nearby military camp to help out in the search. They would look over the larger part of Canterbury. Sadly, on January 17th, two men found her body, lying in a patch of overgrown scrub and pine. The body was laying at the bottom of a steep embankment, covered in a thin layer of branches and leaves. She was placed in the fetal position, and was fully clothed in what she was last seen wearing, minus the previously mentioned underwear and shorts. She was killed by a massive blow to the head. Law enforcement have stated that there have been at least 450 suspects over the years. In 2010, police would publicly state that the suspect list was now narrowed down to 20. That 20 included Kirsty's brother and father, John and Sid. Detectives have stated more than a few times they believe these two were involved, but by 2018, both were finally dismissed as suspects. The only other publicly known, yet still not dismissed claim, was months after the murder, police asked the public for information on a green Commer van. The van was described as a 1961 model. 
that could be used as a camper. The van was either blue or a faded blue-green. That van model is known to be used by tourists and also drifters. The van was very rare and as few as two matching its description have ever been in New Zealand. The van was seen in the area at the time of her disappearance and the witness was very reliable because he was a mechanic and he gave a very detailed description. But other witnesses also reported seeing the van in the Ashburton area weeks before her disappearance. Two weeks before the murder, one witness spotted the van with three young Maori men inside. That same witness would see the same van just two days before the murder, with one of the young Maori men standing next to it. Police would also distribute flyers, looking for information on a girl that was seen near the van, close to where Bentley had disappeared. Despite the public pleas, this girl never came forward. Her identity and her connection to the van remain unknown to this day. But by July 2022, a $100,000 reward was offered for information leading to the arrest of the suspect or suspects involved. Three months later in October, detectives announced the list was down to 10 potential suspects. One of these was a name that had never been brought up before until the reward was posted, one that had a lot of potential. The lead was so good that rumors have swirled that detectives now have their top suspect, although police have refuted these claims. The case still remains unsolved, but it is very active right now, and we could be seeing a resolution soon. La Mancha Negra In 1986, in Caracas, Venezuela, road workers are patching up parts of a highway between Caracas and the airport. While doing this, they would come across one of the weirdest mysteries on this layer, as a 50-yard long blob of sludge would appear seemingly out of nowhere. At first, no one was alarmed, but it would start to spread, and as much as 8 miles of the highway was soon covered with this unknown material. It was gummy in texture, and seemed to expand when the weather was hot and wet, but would start to shrink when it was cold and dry. It was described as being about an inch thick, greasy black thick blob that had the consistency of bubble gum, and made the road slick as ice. Obviously, this made driving extremely unsafe, causing numerous vehicles to crash into each other or run off the road. It's commonly cited that at least 1,800 deaths were attributed to La Mancha Negra between 1986 and 1992, yet this has never been substantiated by a direct source. By 1991, a group of experts were sent out to find the source of the substance, and the Venezuelan government stated that it had spent millions of dollars investigating. They would even consult experts in the US, Canada, and Europe. They first tried pressure washing it away, but that did not work. Neither did scrubbing it with detergents. They would even scrape the top layer of roads away and resurface it, only to see it reappear. Venezuela would eventually pour tons of pulverized limestone over it to dry it up, but this created a different problem. When the roads would become so dusty, the drivers complained that the air was unbreathable, and by 1996, La Mancha Negra returned, bringing slick roads with it again. Venezuela would end up getting special cleaning equipment from Germany, and this again stopped the problem for years. Yet by 2001, the mysterious smudge returned. A study that same year concluded that, quote, After 14 years of study, no one knows what the stuff is, where it comes from, or how to get rid of it, end quote. So what is this mysterious black blob? Originally, Experts believed it could be raw sewage from the nearby slums that was running downhill up and under the asphalt, which then caused a chemical reaction, which in turn broke the roads down. Another theory was that the Venezuelan government went with cheap, flawed asphalt, which would leak oil when the temperature would rise. However, the most acceptable theory is the countless amount of leaky old cars driving around Venezuela spraying fluids all over the highway. It's believed that because of the extremely cheap gas prices there, that Venezuelans will drive old gas guzzlers, as it doesn't really matter how much gas they use. These leaks, along with the dust on the road, create the black paste. Lane Bryant Shooting On February 2, 2008, four customers, Jennifer Bishop, 34, Carrie Chiuso, 33, Sarah Safransky, 22, Connie Wolfolk, 37, and 42-year-old store manager, Rhonda McFarlane, as well as one unnamed employee, were at the Lane Bryant Clothing Outlet in the Brookside Marketplace in Tenley Park, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago. At 10.44 a.m., police would receive an emergency call to respond to the store. A woman would whisper, Lane Bryant, before the 911 dispatcher heard a man's voice in the background yell, quote, I'm losing it, end quote. Then the phone would go dead. When police got there, they found all five women in the back of the store, dead from gunshot wounds, along with the one victim who was wounded, yet lived, has remained unnamed that person being a part-time employee at the store. The man had apparently posed as a delivery driver and then pulled his gun and forced him into the back room and started shooting them. The shopping center would go into lockdown while it was canvassed by the police. 
but after a thorough search of the area, no suspect was found. Law enforcement would let the shopping center reopen, as the perp had left the immediate area, and although witnesses did see the gunman outside the store, no suspects have ever been identified. The man was described as an African American, 25 to 35 years old, 6 foot to 6 foot 2, between 230 to 260 pounds. He had thick braided hair and a receding hairline, with one braid lying over the right side of his face at cheek level, and four light green beads on the end of that braid. He wore a black winter coat, a black cap, and dark jeans. And because the store had no security cameras, clues were scarce. Although police would look at security camera footage from locations within a mile radius of the attacks, they still found no clues. A $100,000 reward for information leading to the arrest would be donated by Lane Bryant's parent company, Charmin Shoppers. The motive seemed to be robbery that somehow went awry. A police sketch, along with a computer rendering, of the suspect would be released eventually, and it generated over two dozen leads almost immediately. Investigators have stated they do believe someone knows who the suspect is, but maybe are just in denial that it could be him, or perhaps they just don't want to give him up. Other investigators speculate he got in prison for something else, or possibly is already deceased. A more frightening theory states that he jumped on I-80, which runs right past the store, and goes all the way across the country. It's possible that just like the I-70 killer, he targeted this store because of that reason and doesn't even live in the area. To this day, 7,500 leads have been followed, yet no arrest. Large Antarctic Sea Mammal On February 13, 1958, around 7 p.m., a Japanese research vessel named Soya would encounter a large creature in the ice near Lutso Home Bay. Since it was still late summer, the midnight sun provided excellent light. On the bridge was the captain, navigator, chief engineer, and helmsman. They would see a black object about a thousand feet in front of the ship. They at first thought it was an abandoned drum can, but when they got closer, they could make out an animal. It had brown hair, and the creature had the face of a cow, although other men on the crew said it looked more like a horse, or maybe even a monkey. Some reports said the head was about two and a half feet long, while others said it was nearly five feet. The ears were much like that of a hippopotamus, and moved twitchingly. The entire animal was around 30 feet long, with a long tail that fluttered, and two bumps on its back. Other crew members would spot it from the opposite direction, and noted that it had a serrated fin on its back. The chief engineer would take the camera to the bridge to get a photo, but by the time he made it, the animal had disappeared. The creature stayed visible in total for about 30 seconds. This would be the only known sighting in history, and sadly, no video or photo proof exists. The captain would go on to document the incident in a book he wrote. The fact that the crew were all experienced seafarers made it even more credible, as it's hard to believe they would misidentify an existing animal. Of course, there's something to be said for being in the icy sea for long periods of time. That could lead to psychological stress, and it's been known to create mass hallucinations. According to the sailors on the ship, its size and morphology are different than any other known animal. The captain would nickname the creature Antarctic Godzilla because it looks sort of similar to the fictional creature. Some believe this animal is in the same family as the Cabagon, which is another cryptid that was discovered by Japanese fishermen. So, it sounds like this cryptid could be real. I mean, who knows what's at the bottom of the ocean. Lead Mask Case Another famous one here. On August 20th, 1966, a young boy was out flying a kite in Nitoro, Rio de Janeiro. When he came up on two deceased male bodies, the boy would go report it to authorities, but since the area had difficult terrain, the police would not be able to make it to the bodies until the next day. When they finally arrived, they would come across an odd scene. The two bodies rested next to each other. Each one wore a formal suit, a lead eye mask, and a waterproof coat. There were no signs of a struggle or trauma, but next to the corpses lay an empty water bottle and a packet containing two wet towels along with a notebook. In the notebook was a set of weird instructions that read, quote, 1630, be at the specified location, 1830, in just capsules, after the effect, protect metals, a weight signal, mask, end quote. Authorities would identify the two men as Manuel Pereira de Cruz and Miguel Jose Viana, two electronic technicians. The whole thing was bizarre, and detectives tried to piece together what could have possibly happened. They found that the two men were last seen by their families on August 17th, just three days prior, and they had mentioned going to purchase some supplies for work. They would then take a bus to Niteroy, where they would arrive at 2.30 p.m. They would then purchase two waterproof coats and head to a bar where they bought one bottle of water. The waitress described them as very nervous and noted Miguel checked his watch frequently. 
It is believed they left the bar at around 3.15 p.m. and went straight to Moro de Ventum, where their bodies were found. As far as to what happened and why, who knows? There's a few theories. The most common one seems to be that the two men were trying to contact extraterrestrials, or maybe even ghosts, by using psychedelic drugs. That story came from a friend of both men, named El Cio Gomez, who claimed they were scientific spiritualists. They had at some point with Gomez, tried to build a device that would allow them to contact Mars. It failed, obviously, and the device exploded. However, Gomez also claimed that their spiritualist group had a meeting with a UFO one time that ended with a blinding flash and a large explosion. What was interesting, though, was detectives did go look at Miguel's workshop. They found the lead scraps that were used to make the mask, which were really just eye covers, and a book of passages where the phrase, intense luminosity, was highlighted. Presumably, why they had to make the pair of lead eye shields, but the handwriting belonged to neither Miguel or Manuel. But if they were on drugs, we'll never know. Because by the time the autopsy occurred, the bodies were too decomposed to reliably test for drugs. Lisa Marie Young On the night of June 29, 2002, Lisa Marie Young, a 21-year-old indigenous Canadian, would leave her parents' residence at 11 p.m. to go to a nightclub with several friends, a move that her parents would later state was strange due to Lisa's busy schedule that week. But even stranger was when Lisa did not return that night or the next day. They would call her and she didn't answer. However, they assumed Lisa was just too busy to answer and were not alarmed originally. But on July 1st, over a full day after Lisa had left her home for the party, her parents would start to grow concerned. That concern would only get stronger when Lisa's former roommate visited to ask where Lisa was. It was at this point the family would start to panic. They would start going through Lisa's phone book and calling all of her contacts. When none of them knew where she was, Lisa's parents would finally go to the RCMP. But surprisingly, or maybe not, they would tell the parents they had to wait 48 hours before they could report an adult missing, which is nothing more than a common myth. The RCMP did end up sending an officer by to ask questions and get a photo of Lisa. A few days later, the RCMP would contact the Youngs to tell them their daughter's disappearance was now being investigated by the Serious Crimes Unit. So detectives would start to retrace Lisa's steps. They found that, at some point in the night, Lisa and her friend, Dallas Holy, were approached by a man named Christopher Adair, who invited them to a house party, offering to take the pair in his older model red Jaguar. They would end up accepting and went to the party. They would then go to a second party in the Cathers Lake area of Nanaimo. Lisa would begin to get hungry and wanted to go grab a bite to eat. Adair offered to take her to get some food, and at around 4.30 that morning, Lisa would call her friend Dallas back. To Dallas's shock, Lisa stated, quote, Dallas, I don't know what's going on. This guy won't bring me back. We're sitting in a driveway on Bowen Road, and he won't bring me back. I'm bored. I'm getting pissed off. End quote. She would also send a text saying, quote, Come get me. They won't let me leave. End quote. The police were now certain. Foul play was involved. They would conduct several searches in remote areas of Nanimo, but found nothing. They would eventually trace down the owner of the Jaguar. He was actually Christopher Adair's grandmother, and she had loaned him the car. He would be brought in and questioned. And in an unusual move, the RCMP brought in Lisa's mother to ask him where her daughter was. I guess they were hoping to guilt the young man. But he would reply, quote, I can't. I'm sorry. I don't mean to disrespect your family. End quote. The man would be released when police could not find any evidence. The owner of the Jaguar would then sell the car after she had its steam cleaned. Police would go inspect the car, but any evidence had already been destroyed. This is a case not unlike that of the Highway of Tears, in which the RCMP has really taken a black eye over the way they handled it, such as making them wait 48 hours to report Lisa missing. Then, they didn't even bother searching for her until two months later, leaving family and friends to do it on their own. And like many parents of a missing child, they tried very hard to run down leads and be involved, but at some point, the RCMP actually stopped providing them info or even corresponding with them. Not surprisingly, this was a really bad look. By June 2021, RCMP did state that some new information did come to light, but they couldn't share it. Now obviously, the link in this case is Christopher Adair, the man with the red Jaguar. He has always claimed he dropped Lisa off near a taxi, yet no records from the taxi services could confirm this. Theory split between Adair being responsible versus Adair and someone at the party being responsible. There's also a lot of rumors about the drug trade and the Hells Angels being involved as well. Earl of Lucan 
If your first thought after seeing this smug looking face is, man that guy looks like a jerk, well, you would be right. Lord Lucan, or known by his real name, John Bingham, was the seventh Earl of Lucan. He was an Anglo-Irish aristocrat and the son of George Bingham, the sixth Earl of Lucan. The silver spoon born John would grow up to work at a London based merchant bank before quitting to become a professional gambler, as he loved to gamble. He also loved power boats and the Aston Martin he drove. His expensive tastes were well known throughout the area. He would marry Veronica Duncan in 1963, to whom he had three children with. But by 1972, the marriage would fall apart. John would move out, but he got a place nearby. A bitter custody battle would begin, and John would eventually lose. And not being able to handle losing, John would start to spy on Veronica. He would do everything he could to get the custody of his children. He would even record his and Veronica's conversations. Some would actually say he became obsessed. This obsession would lead to his downfall, as rising legal expenses, as well as gambling losses, started to take a toll on his finances, and things would come to a head on the night of November 7th, 1974, when the children's nanny, Sandra Rivet, would lay the kids down to sleep. She would ask Lady Lucan if she would like some tea. She would then head downstairs to make some at around 9pm, but she never returned. Veronica would go look and see what was taking Sandra so long, but on her way, she would be attacked. As she screamed, the man would scream, shut up. She would instantly recognize his voice. It was that of her ex, John Bingham, Lord Lucan. He would begin to choke Veronica until she squeezed his testicles, forcing him to release her. She would ask where Sandra was, and John admitted he killed her. He would then calmly walk up to see his kids, and Veronica, who was terrified, told him she would help him escape if he promised to leave in a few days. He would then offer to go get her a towel to clean up the wounds on her face. But as he stepped into the bathroom, Veronica would make her escape. This is where the mystery really begins. As John would leave the home and call his mom and ask her to go get the kids because he saw a man attacking Veronica. To this day, no one knows where exactly this call was made from. What is known is he left there and went 42 miles away to his friends the Maxwell Scots. He would then leave there and call his mom back about 12.30 a.m. and told her he would be in touch later that day. She tried to get him to speak to the police constable who had accompanied her home, but he declined, saying he would call them later that morning. So where did he go? Originally, investigators seemed to believe that suicide was the most likely scenario, but as the years passed, detectives began to reconsider. Detective Chief Superintendent Roy Ransom believed that he had gotten all the way to South Africa. Other detectives think he just lived in different countries the rest of his life, while Susan Maxwell Scott, the last person to see him, speculated that he used shadowy underground financiers to help him get out of the country, but then they probably killed him because the risk of helping him was too much, and then they end up burying him in Switzerland. That's a very specific theory, and it's been shared by a few other people as well. Man in the Iron Mask This is another pretty famous mystery. The Man in the Iron Mask was an unidentified prisoner of state during King Louis XIV's reign of France. The man was arrested on July 28, 1669, under the fake name Ustash Dogger, he would start his incarceration nearly a month later on August 24th, where he would remain in custody for the remaining 34 years of his life. When he died in 1703, he was buried under the fake name of Markili. Centuries later, historians still do not know who this man was or why he was imprisoned, although it is known that he did not wear an iron mask. That was misreported by French philosopher Voltaire. The mask was actually made of cloth, and contrary to legend, he did not wear it all the time. He instead only had to wear it when being transported between prisons and when he went to prayers. So basically, any time outside of his cell. There have been other clues that came from documents that surfaced in the 19th century. One in which the man was labeled, quote, only a valet, end quote, after he was arrested. It was also stated that he was arrested for, quote, what he had seen, what he knew, and what he was employed to do. End quote. So just who was this man imprisoned under the name of Ustash Dogger? There are so many theories that it would be impossible to go over each one of them. Voltaire claimed that the man was King Louis's older illegitimate brother. Variations of this assertion have been proposed ever since, such as it being the king's twin brother as well as it being the king's father. Others have claimed it was a French general or an Italian diplomat. Well, we still really don't know and likely never will. Max Headroom Signal Hijacking on November 22, 1987, WGN TV viewers would tune into the 9 o'clock news to see a bizarre mystery unfold. At 9.14 p.m., 
during the sports segment. The viewer screen would go black for about 15 seconds before footage of a person wearing a max headroom mask and sunglasses would appear on screen. He would rock erratically in front of a rotating corrugated metal panel that mimicked the real Max Headroom's background. This would be accompanied by the staticky and garbled buzzing sound. The entire incident lasted about 28 seconds before WGN engineers could change the frequency of the signal, cutting off the hijacker. But the hijacker wasn't through. Later on that night, about 11.20 p.m., the local PBS station in Chicago would have its airing of Doctor Who interrupted by the same culprit. This time, he spoke with distorted audio. He would make a comment about nerds while holding a can of Pepsi, saying, Catch the wave, which was a slogan for Coca-Cola. He would go on to make numerous comments and just acted weird in general, finishing by exposing part of his butt and having some woman in a French maid costume spank him with a fly swatter. The image would then fade into static and the viewers would be brought back to watching Doctor Who. The entire thing lasted about 90 seconds. Strangely enough, there were no engineers on duty to counteract the signal. To this day, the answer to who was behind it and why is still a mystery. Initial investigations showed that it would have taken extensive technical expertise to pull off, as well a significant amount of transmitting power, and that the pirate broadcast most likely was in the light of sight of both stations broadcast towers. Law enforcement first speculated that it was an inside job by a disgruntled employee or former employee. They also looked at the underground hacker community that existed in Chicago at the time, yet they never found a solid suspect. It's been over 30 years and no one has came forward, which is odd considering the statute of limitations expired in 1992. Miss X On March 18, 1967, a deceased woman's body would be found on the side of Porter Road in Bear, Delaware. The dump site, like a lot of these mysteries, was near a major highway, that of I-95. The only thing she was wearing was a pair of blue bikini-like underwear, a red ribbon in her hair, and her legs were encased in a whitish colored laundry bag. She was thought to have attempted an abortion, as a substance that resembled an abortion-inducing chemical was found in her vaginal cavity. However, this was not the cause of death. Neither was murder. Instead, the woman died from an infection that she never got medical care for. Thankfully, in the middle of researching this case, I found out that this one is most likely solved. I say most likely, because the update came on December 1st, 2022, which is just a week before this recording. The woman's name is Patrona Patmios. The discovery came when a Greek man uploaded his DNA into GED Match and found that he had a sister that he never knew of. Since the man did not speak English, he got a friend that lived nearby that did and asked him to contact a Delaware Forensics Division. The mystery of her identity is now solved, yet how she ended up in a laundry bag in a rural area of Delaware remains unknown. Moha Moha This turtle-like sea creature supposedly lives in the Great Barrier Reef near Queensland, Australia. It was said to be a monster turtle fish that was about 30 feet long with an enormous shaped body, a long neck, and 12 foot long tail. Its face looked like that of a lizard with teeth or serrated jaw bones. The skin was glossy and smooth as satin. It had no visible nostrils and its well-rounded jaws were 18 inches long. The head and neck were greenish white with white spots on the neck and a white band around a very black eye. The dome-shaped shell was about 8 feet across and 5 feet high and slate gray in color and smooth. The long tail was pale white with thumbnail size scales and a chocolate brown fin. The creature was first sighted by school teacher Selena Lavelle and a small group of friends on Great Sandy Island in 1890. They would observe the creature for about 30 minutes before it finally swam off into the sea. She claimed to have been within five feet of the creature. This would be the first of nine different sightings in that area over the next several days. The name come from the aboriginals who called it Moha Moha, meaning dangerous turtle. It was known to attack their villages and snap at the legs of natives. So what did Selena Lavelle see that day? Well, in her description, she also noted the creature's head and tail did not seem to belong to the same creature. This has led many to suggest what she was really looking at was a turtle entangled in a fishing net with the mesh full of other contents, like seaweed and debris. Michele Mbembe Another cryptid here, Michele Mbembe, which translates to one who stops the flow of rivers, it's a water-dwelling creature that supposedly lives in the Congo River Basin. It looks very similar to that of a brontosaurus. It has four legs, a long neck, a single tooth, and smooth skin. The first description that related it to the brontosaurus comes from 1909. In the autobiography of Carl Hagenbach, who was a big game hunter, he claimed to have heard from two separate sources about the creature living in Rhodesia, modern-day Zimbabwe. He said the natives described it as, quote, 
half elephant, half dragon, end quote. Hagenbeck would also write, quote, It can only be some kind of dinosaur, seemingly akin to the brontosaurus, end quote. Another account by a German captain, sent to Cameroon in 1913, said, quote, The animal is said to be of a brownish-gray color, with smooth skin. Its size approximately that of an elephant, at least that of a hippopotamus. It is said to have a long and very flexible neck, and only one tooth, but a very long one. Some say it's a horn. A few spoke about a long, muscular tail, like that of an alligator. Canoes coming near it are said to be doomed. The animal is said to attack the vessels at once, and to kill the crews, but without eating the bodies. The creature is said to live in the caves, that have been washed out by the river in the clay, of its shores at sharp bends. It is said to climb the shores even at daytime, in search of food. Its diet is said to be entirely vegetable." End quote. So does this cryptid actually exist? Scientists say probably not. They cite the lack of physical evidence. They say that what the villagers seen is more than likely a black rhino. Adding to that fact is several expeditions have been launched to find the creature, and none have ever came back with solid proof, along with the Google Maps satellite images that have captured elephant herds, yet somehow haven't seen this giant of a creature. Before the believers, they tend to fall into three different categories. Some speculate that it's some kind of undiscovered dinosaur that is similar to that of a mid-sized brontosaurus. Others believe it's some kind of reptile or lizard something like a giant long-necked freshwater turtle, or possibly even a giant iguana, then there are those who believe it is a mammal. Finally, there's the thought that the whole thing has never been anything more than a hoax. Monster of Florence. Where to even start on this one? This case is so complex and has so many moving parts that it doesn't work well in this format. Even a summary is hard to do. If you want a good in-depth video on it, I recommend checking out Lazy Masquerade's video on it. But just as other mysteries like this, I will try to give the best abridged version that I can. Starting on August 21st, 1968, and going through September 1985, an unknown serial killer would terrorize the province of Florence in Italy. The unapprehended killer has killed at least 14 people, and possibly 16. The case has taken numerous twists and turns, and different suspects have been charged at one time or another, only to have the real killer go out and kill again while the suspect is in custody, just to prove to the authorities that they were wrong and to make sure no one took credit for his murders. The Elmo of the murders were always the same. It consisted of couples who would seek out a lover's lane for privacy. The killer, who would be hiding nearby, would wait for the couple to get intimate. That way he could make sure their defenses would be down, and they wouldn't be paying attention to what was going on outside the car. The man would then ambush the couple, shooting both. He would then end his crime by disfiguring the female body with the knife. This would be his ritual, or calling card of sorts. The cases took place on moonless nights, and on evenings when people didn't have to go to work the next day, either because it was a weekend or because of a holiday. The locations were always different from one time to the next, but always in the Florence suburbs. The murders were also linked by the same gun, a Beretta 22 caliber pistol loaded with Winchester Series H bullets. The firing pin in the gun always left a particular mark on the shell casing of the bullets, easily linking all the murders. Criminologists point out that the monster of Florence murders are very unique. For one, he would take very long pauses between attacks, usually about a year, but he once stopped for seven years, which is pretty rare. He also never had any sexual activity with the victims. In fact, he tried to interact with the victims as little as possible. Finally, his murders weren't by impulse. He thoroughly planned out his crimes, choosing nights with hardly any moonlight, and then waiting for the best opportunity. As mentioned, the first murder was in 1968, and at first, that one seemed like an open and shut case, as the victims, Barbara Locci, 31, and Antonio Lo Bianco, 29, were murdered in a car in a wooded area, and they were both married. Barbara was well known to have had multiple affairs. The police would eventually arrest her husband, and claim that he got tired of her cheating, and just in a fit of rage, murdered the two. The husband, Stefano Mili, would only serve six years in prison, because in 1974, another couple would be murdered with the same gun. There is some debate among detectives about Mili's guilt or innocence. The first murder was of his wife. A knife wasn't used, and although the gun wasn't found, he did originally confess. Yet if he was responsible, how did that gun end up in the hands of a serial killer that would terrorize Florence for another 17 years, one of those occurring while he was in prison? It doesn't seem likely. The last murders occurred in 1985, and as far as the suspects go, there's been a long list of exonerated candidates. Some speculate that it was a satanic cult. Some say a police officer. Others speculate a peeping Tom. Some think the perp was someone that was never even suspected or interviewed. There's been an attempt to tie it to the Zodiac killings as well. After the investigation of 100,000 men, more than a dozen arrested, 
and tons of false accusations, the killer still remains uncaptured. Morgan Nick On the night of July 9, 1995, in Alma, Arkansas, six-year-old Morgan Nick would go to a Little League baseball game with her mother, Colleen. At around 10.30 p.m., Morgan would ask to go catch lightning bugs with her friends. Her mother was unsure at first, but she relented and let her go. After about 15 minutes, her playmates would return back to the field, and Morgan wasn't with them, and she wasn't anywhere in sight. Colleen began to panic. A search would ensue, followed shortly later by a massive investigation that included the FBI along with local authorities. They were able to establish the time of abduction at 10.45 p.m. Morgan was last seen standing near her mother's car where she had stopped to empty the sand out of her shoes. Morgan's friends reported that a creepy man was talking to her as she began putting her shoes back on. Other witnesses would corroborate this as they said they had seen a man watching Morgan play with the other children at the park. They also reported seeing a red Ford pickup truck with a white camper parked nearby, which is long believed to have belonged to the suspect. The man was described as being around six foot tall, medium to solid build, a mustache, and a slight beard. He was thought to be between 23 and 38 years old. In spite of the fact that the investigation turned up thousands of leads, no solid clues ever led to her whereabouts. The FBI and local community would offer up to a $60,000 reward for any tip that led to her recovery and the arrest of the suspect. This has led to numerous sightings across the country, given hope that Morgan may still be alive. By November 2021, the FBI would announce a development in the case. A person of interest was named. That man was Billy Jack Lynx. The FBI was asking the public for information about him. The man was no stranger to law enforcement either. In August of 1995, just two months after Morgan's abduction, Lynx tried to abduct a girl from a Sonic, just eight miles from where Morgan was abducted. The biggest detail that stuck out to the detectives was he drove a red 1986 Chevrolet pickup, although it didn't have a white camper shell like the one that was reported during Morgan's abduction. But Link's neighbor stated that he thought that the truck had a white camper at some point. Detectives have stated as well that they're not even 100% sure that the person in the red truck that night was even related to the kidnapping, but they were never able to rule it out either. As far as Link's go, he died years before the connection could be made. Detectives went over notes from the 1995 arrest of Link's and found that his truck had duct tape, a rope, a tarp, and a machete, as well as blood. Sadly, police have lost all this evidence, but one thing going against this theory, Lynx would have been 70 years old at the time of the abduction, which goes against every witness account that said the man was 23 to 38. It's been close to 30 years, and the case still is officially unsolved. Mount Asahidaki SOS Incident On July 24, 1989, near Mount Asahidaki in Japan, Rescue helicopters would be dispatched to find two missing hikers. As pilots scanned over the area, they came across an encouraging sign. On the ground lay birch logs that spelled out SOS. The tree trunks were about 16 foot each, so the pilots would search the area for the hikers, who they assumed had to be nearby. They were right too, because two miles north of the sign, they found the two mountaineers. They would end up rescuing them and flying them out. They would be taken to a hospital to be checked out and recover. Once there, the hikers were asked about the SOS sign they had made, and shockingly, they answered, What SOS sign? They would go on to say that they had not made one, nor had they even seen it. So the rescue team would return the next day to do a more thorough search. This time they would find fragments of human bones. The bones had traces of animal bites, as well as the bones in the leg and upper body were fractured, possibly while the person was alive. The search team would find a hole just large enough for a single human to fit into, which contained four cassette tapes, a tape recorder, a backpack, some amulets, a human skull, a tripod, a pair of men's basketball shoes, two cameras, a notebook, and a driver's license. Belonging to a man named Kenji Iwamura, a 25-year-old man who had went missing five years earlier when he set out to hike the mountain. He had been reported missing a week after, but no sign of him had been seen up until this point. Even stranger, the skeleton was sent off in hopes of getting more information, and it was determined that the skeleton belonged to that of a woman between the ages of 20 to 40, which would certainly throw the investigators for a loop. This would be changed by 1991, however, when the bones were re-examined and found to be that of a man, most likely Iwamura. The police listened to the recordings they found on the tapes. One was the voice of a young man shouting for over two minutes, in which he exclaimed, quote, SOS, help me. I can't move on the cliff. SOS, help me. The place is where I first met the helicopter. The bamboo is deep and you can't go up, lift me up from here, end quote. No one knows why he left this recording, 
The rest of the tapes were music from anime TV shows. The Forestry Service would look over old aerial photos and found that the SOS was there as early as September 20th, 1987. It was estimated that it would have taken at least two days and a lot of effort to make the giant sign. But how could Iwamura, if it was Iwamura, have did all this? He would have been thin and weak, and it would have been incredibly difficult for him to do. And that doesn't take into account the broken bones, nor the fact that an axe was never found. Of course, maybe the trees had already fell, yet that still would have been quite the task for someone in his condition. An acquaintance of Iwamura confirmed that the anime music tapes did belong to him, as well as the basketball shoes. His parents could not identify that voice on the tape, however. This has long been an eerie mystery that has captured the imagination of the unsolved community. But is it really unsolved? Most investigators now seem to believe there's not really a mystery, as they say it's pretty obvious what happened. Iwamura got stuck down under the cliff, and the bamboo was too deep for him to get back up. He made the recording, then went further down and made the SOS sign. He then passed away after no rescue attempt was made. As far as the broken bones go, he most likely suffered those after the recording, or he would have mentioned it on the tape. Likewise, he most likely suffered the injuries after he cut down the trees. Really, the only mystery is, what happened to the axe he used? Thanks to everyone that listened to Layer 5 of the Unsolved Mystery Mega Iceberg Explained.